Well, it is certainly good to be here with you this morning in Euclid. Uh, I can't honestly say that I've ever been in Euclid before. I know that's hard to imagine, <laughs> but I think this is my first time in the, in the city of Euclid, and uh, we've enjoyed it thus far. Of course, we haven't been here long, just got in last night, and uh, so far we've had a wonderful time uh, with your pastor and his wife. And they're wonderful folks. And we, I don't know when the first time was that we met. It's been several years ago. In, over there in Ashtabula at Bible Baptist Church. And, and uh, we've just run into each other off and on uh, several times in the last few years. And he's always a, a blessing. And I'm sure that you know that. Amen? That's the right place to say amen. <laughs> I want you to take your Bible this morning and open it up to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. And in this Sunday school time today, I want to give you just some principles that I think will be a help and an encouragement to you. One of the most difficult things in Christianity today and one of the most divisive things, one of the hardest things to get a handle on is the subject of music. It really is. There's a lot of confusion over it and there's a lot of fighting and fussing over it and churches split over it and people decide whether or not they want to go to a certain place all because of the music and whether they like it or they don't like it and and it's a problem in Christianity today and the truth is it really shouldn't be it really shouldn't be such a problem and an issue as it is and I think the problem stems from the fact that that we don't often look at it from just a biblical perspective there are, uh, there are a lot of things in the Bible that are spelled out in black and white that tell you that you should or should not do certain things. But then there are a whole lot of things in our life that are not spelled out that way in the Bible. Have you run across anything like that in your life? Let me give you an example. Smoking is not in the Bible. It's not there. There's no verse that says thou shalt not smoke or smoking is a bad thing or a bad testimony. But I could stand here this morning and preach to you and tell you all those things and be on safe biblical ground. You know how I could do that? Because even though there's not a verse that says that, there are great principles in the Word of God that cover those areas that are not spelled out in black and white. And so we bring it under those principles, and with the principles we know what's right and what's wrong and where we ought to go with that issue. We have to do that with a lot of things in our life that were not talked about in specific in the Bible. But God gave us some great principles. And I think quite often <clears throat> the problem we have with music is that we live much of our life under that umbrella of the great principles of the Word of God. And then we take music and we put it over here all by itself in its own separate category and say, well, I like that. But that's not the right way to decide what to do, whether or not I like it. There are some things that you like most I would guess that will destroy you. If I did everything that I like, I would weigh 500 pounds right now at this moment. I'd have a chocolate milkshake in this hand. I'd have a, I'd have a Reese's peanut butter cup in this hand. And there'd be a pecan pie sitting right down there waiting for later. And every once in a while, I'd just disappear and, and uh, come up with a smile on my face. Amen? That's, I like all that stuff. I mean, that's just, if I just did everything I like all the time, that's what I'd be doing. Amen? And I would destroy myself. So there are things that we don't, we just, uh, we may like them or we might appreciate them or we might enjoy them. But we have to bring it all under the principles of the word of God and decide whether or not it's really going to be good for us. And whether or not we really should do that to be pleasing with God. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. And look at verse number 19. Well, verse 18. It says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, the reason I read all four of those verses is that they're all one sentence. It's all one thought. Although each one of those is great truth that will stand alone, all four of them are related, and the relationship is verse number 18. That's the main thought. 
And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Would you agree with me this morning that obviously that is the, the direction of God, the plan of God, the will of God for His children, that they be filled with the Spirit of God. Amen. That's what it says. We're supposed to be filled with the Spirit. And then it goes right into verse number 19. And so speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now with verse number 18 in mind, remember it's all one sentence, it's all one context and all one thought, that's a natural outgrowth of being filled with the Spirit of God. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It says in the Old Testament, He hath put a new song in my mouth, even a song of praise unto our God. Listen, when you get saved, when the Spirit of God comes in and God Himself takes up residence in your life and you're born again and you're redeemed and justified and sanctified, there's automatically a song put in your heart. You may not be the greatest singer, but you have a song. Amen? And you rejoice in the goodness of God. Verse number 20 talks about giving thanks always. Verse 21, submitting yourselves one to, yourselves one to another. Those again are just evidences of verse 18, being filled with the Spirit of God. So what I want to do with, with that thought in mind, uh, I believe our, our music ought to be that which is pleasing and honoring to God. And if we're going to decide what kind of music is pleasing and honoring to God, what is godly music, then we should find the Bible principles that apply, shouldn't we? And then just run it through there and make sure that it fits. I want to give you four principles this morning that will help you to make those determinations. Number one, if we're gonna call it godly music, it should in fact glorify God. Amen. That sounds like a simple one, doesn't it? But it's a, it's a principle that applies. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 31, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Would you then agree that that covers the area of music? Surely it does. Do all to the glory of God. Therefore, if the music I'm listening to or the music that I'm singing or whatever it is glorifies something other than God, it's obviously not godly music. If it's glorifying the things of the world or the things of the flesh or if it's glorifying the one doing the, the singing or the playing, then obviously it's not glorifying God and it's not godly music. That's the first principle. The second principle is this. It should direct our thoughts toward godliness. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter number 4. This is a familiar passage to you. Verse number 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Now that's direction from God. And God says, I want you to think about the right kind of things. Things that are honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report. I want you to think on those things and have those things in your mind. That's where principle number two comes in. If we're going to say music is godly music, then it should direct our thoughts toward godliness. It should help us to think about things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and right and of good report. And if it makes us think of things other than that, then it's most certainly not godly music because it's obvious that God wants us to think about those things. Most things in life pull us one direction or the other, either closer to God in our walk with Him or further away from Him. There are some things that are kind of neutral. But most things pull us one way or the other. They plant thoughts in our mind or they give us desires in our heart. Whatever it is that moves us one way or the other. And it may be a little different for some individuals than for others. But most things pull us one way or the other. The music that you're listening to is very powerful. Because it puts pictures in your mind. Puts thoughts in your mind. I, I'm not real familiar with this particular hymn. No, we've, uh, we've seen it a few times, and I was just thumbing through it this morning and looking at it. I don't know if the song's in there. Probably, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Is that in there? It's in most of them. When you, when you sing through all the verses of A Mighty Fortress is Our God, by the time you're done, 
You want to charge hell with a squirt gun and take on the devil hand to hand. That's what you want to do. You know why? Because of the words and the message and the, and the majestic feeling of the music. It sets your mind toward the things of God and how great and how powerful and how almighty he truly is. That's a good thing. If you get done listening to a song and instead your thoughts are taken toward the things of the world and the things of the flesh, you just mark it down. That's not godly music. How, does, how is it affecting your thought life and how is it affecting your mood? It should direct our thoughts toward godliness. Number three, it should reflect the new man. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Excuse me, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Isn't that a wonderful verse? What a wonderful truth that the moment that you get saved, you become a new creature in Christ. Now, when it says, Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new, you know it's not talking about the external stuff. And if you got saved wearing, uh, wearing brown pants and a green shirt, when you stood up from wherever it was, you were still wearing brown pants and a green shirt, right? I mean, if you, had, if you had your head shaved, your head was still shaved when you stood up. That's just how it works. But everything inside changed. Everything inside changed. You became a new creature in Christ. You went from lost to saved. Your eternal destination changed. And along with that, your desires changed. They really did. The things that, that drew you and appealed to you before you trusted Christ and became a new creature, all of a sudden they don't hold the same appeal anymore because all of the inside changed. And then the longer you know Christ, the more what's inside begins to work itself toward the outside and the outside changes too. It really does. But in an instant, everything inside changes and you're a new creature in Christ. Our music ought to reflect that. Maybe before you got saved, you hung out in places where they played a certain kind of music. Maybe you were into the scene where they played the, the metal music or whatever it was. And, and then you got saved. Well, that needs to change to reflect what happened in here. Maybe you hung out in bars where they played country music and stuff about, you know, cheating on your wife and kicking the dog and all that kind of stuff. And so now that you're saved, those, those songs don't appeal anymore. You don't want to talk about that stuff. You don't want to think about that kind of stuff. You don't want to think about the wickedness that went on in those places when you were hearing that music and the, and the things that you did that were associated with all that music playing. And that takes your mind to a place you don't want to go anymore. So your music begins to reflect that you're a new creature in Christ. And suddenly, the songs in that book, when at one time you thought, ugh, what awful stuff. All of a sudden, songs that you wouldn't give a second thought to suddenly appeal to you. Amen. Suddenly they do. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All of a sudden, that sounds like a wonderful thing to say. Amen? Because you know that's what happened. And you start singing songs, nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's wonderful. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. What a wonderful thought. Victory in Jesus. All of a sudden, that has a whole new meaning, doesn't it? It's not just an old song that Grandpa sang but way back when. All of a sudden, that's what happened to me. And it should reflect, our music reflects that we're a new creature in Christ. Number four. I want you to turn... To the book of Haggai. That's where your pages are still slightly stuck together. It's in the Old Testament. Just a little short book. It's easy to miss. If you have trouble finding it, it's right between Zephaniah and Zechariah. <laughs> They're probably all three stuck together. <clears throat> but if you, go to, if you go to Matthew and go backwards, you'll find it real fast. It's toward the end of the Old Testament. Just a short little book. The fourth principle is found in Haggai chapter 2. Chapter number 2, verse 11. That's where we'll start. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. 
So here's a priest, and he's got something that's holy. It's set apart for the service of God. And he comes up and he touches this, this common thing. Does this common thing become holy because he was carrying something holy? That's the question they asked. And the answer was, no, it doesn't. That holiness doesn't transfer. Now, look, if you would, at verse number 13. Then said Haggai, if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. So he's got something holy and he touches this. This doesn't automatically become holy. But if you've got somebody that was over here and they're unclean because they've touched a dead body and then they come and touch this, does it become unclean? And the answer was, yes, it does. The uncleanness spreads. Here's the fourth principle. The unclean defiles the clean. The unclean defiles the clean. You, you put clean and dirty together. And what you end up with is more dirty. Amen? The dirt defiles the clean. That's the way it works. The unclean defiles the clean. I like to dig in the dirt. I like to plant stuff. I like to get out there and work and, and uh, do all that kind of stuff. We don't get a chance to do it much. We're not at our house. We have a little house in Kentucky, and we're not there very often. We get to go there tomorrow. It'll be the first time in a long time. We get to go there tomorrow and be there four nights in a row. We're so excited we can hardly stand it. I'm going to get out and play in the dirt this week. I am. I'm going to be pulling weeds and digging dirt and just doing all kinds of stuff. I have some little edging blocks to put around some of my, my plants and stuff. And we have peaches on our peach tree and just exciting stuff. And as soon as I stick my clean hands in the dirt, that dirt just becomes clean. You know better than that, don't you? What happens? Well, my hands become dirty because the unclean defiles the clean. The same thing is true in the spiritual realm. That's why you don't take your favorite song from before you got saved and put Christian words to it and stand up and sing it in church. You're, you might be sincere and your motives might be pure. I understand that. I've seen people do that. I remember when I was just a kid, somebody, somebody did that. And, and I remember uh, there was a fuss over it and I didn't understand what the fuss was. Let me tell you what the fuss is. When you stand up to sing that song, that was your favorite song when you were lost and now you put Christian words to it and the music begins to play and you start to sing. Don't ever forget that probably half the people out there that was their favorite song too. They know that song. And when you start to sing, they're not thinking about your new words. They're thinking, oh, I know that song. And their mind goes to the song they know and the places they were and the things they did and all those things. And now you've just taken that and taken their thoughts toward ungodliness. Right. See, the unclean defiles the clean. You might have good words, but because of the associations that music had with it, all of a sudden the whole package is unclean. And it's counterproductive. The unclean defiles the clean. Now, in our, in our last few minutes, let me just very quickly give you some some practical application of those principles, all right? Did you get the four? If not, you can, you can check with somebody later and copy down what they wrote, okay? Here are three practical applications of that, those four principles. Number one, whether you're singing, playing, listening, whatever it is, make sure that the method is right. That's the, the style of music, the presentation, all of that kind of thing. It, it needs to be, that's where 1 Corinthians 10, 31 comes in, to the glory of God. That's why you don't sing Amazing Grace with Elvis gyrations. Amen. You don't do that. It's the, wrong, it's the wrong method. It's the wrong way to present that truth in a, in a fleshly and carnal manner. That's just not the right way to do it and the end result is bad now there are there are ditches on both sides of the road what we need to do is find a place of, of balance over here on this side there's a there's a philosophy and a thinking in in conservative christianity today that says that music must be painful in order to be spiritual if you like it it can't possibly be good so it's just got to be downright painful. It's got to be dull as dirt. 
and just miserable to listen to. Over here on the other side uh, is the group that says, well, it, the only thing that matters is that you like it. So what we're going to do is take uh, the music that you just heard in the, in the club last night. We're going to play that in church. And then, then we'll have our band and our praise team and we'll have your eyes rolled back in your head and, and have you flopping around on the floor. And, and that's good. No. Both of those are wrong and way out of balance. And the truth is, both of those are nothing more than flesh on display. It's the truth. It's just opposite extremes. This one is flesh on display with the drums blaring and the beat going and all the rest. And this one is flesh on display saying, look how well I can do this. Look how beautifully trained my voice is. I can do this better than you. You just listen while I, while I thrill you with my song. It's just flesh on display, both sides. So what do we have to do? Take the good songs, right music, the right message, and then present it with passion and enthusiasm. Amen? We need to find the right method. Secondly, make sure the messenger is right. The messenger. That's why you don't have the guy that was playing in the bars last night come play for you on Sunday morning. You don't do, that's why you don't hire the, the uh, Catholic organist to come play for you on Sunday night because you need an organ player. You don't do that. It's the wrong messenger. It's the wrong messenger. The song might be right, but the messenger is wrong. That's why you don't go out and buy Willie Nelson sings Amazing Grace. Amen. Willie's the wrong messenger. You understand that? Wrong messenger. By the same token, that's why you don't go by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir sings Amazing Grace. You say, but that's different than that, that Willie stuff. Oh, yeah, it is. If anything, it's probably more deceptive. Because anybody with half a brain can look at Willie and say, he doesn't know what he's singing about. But you look at the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, and there they are all dressed up in a beautiful orchestra and big majestic music and beautifully done and beautiful choral arrangements. And you say, oh, that must be godly. That's not godly at all. Listen, they're part of a cult that's dragging millions of people to hell every day all around the world. The last thing we need to do is go buy something and put money in their coffers to help them do that. The song might be a good song, but that's the wrong messenger. And then finally, make sure the message is right. Make sure the message is right. Make sure it's scriptural. Make sure it's not something ungodly and unscriptural. You say, but, but that was grandma's favorite song. That's why we sing it. We know it's not right. Well, if grandma was saved and she's in heaven now, God won't let her sing it anymore either. So she'll understand if you quit. She'll, she'll let you have a pass on that one. She really will. Listen, there are plenty of wonderful songs you can sing. And you find one that's not scriptural, just you can leave it to the side. It'll be all right. It really will. Or sometimes you come across a hymn in the hymnal that's written from a, a, a wrong theological perspective. And, and there might be one verse that's just, you know, <laughs> just wrong. Well, skip it. That won't hurt anything. You can skip that verse. Uh, enjoy, the, enjoy the verse that's right and skip the rest of it and have a wonderful time. Amen? With that being said, let me just say that don't get weird. Yeah. It's easy to get weird. Sometimes we get weird. <laughs> we take the ball and we run with it a bit too far and we get weird. What I mean by that is <clears throat> every song is, is an average of three minutes long. Some more, some less. Average three minutes. You can't give every aspect of a theological truth in three minutes. You just can't. As a matter of fact, you can preach a series for a month and not give every aspect of a theological truth. I had a man that came to me. I was preaching in Oklahoma City and came to me after the service. I sang grace greater than our sin. And he just chewed me up one side and down the other. He said, you can't sing that. That's unscriptural, wicked. I said, what's wrong with that? He said, it says, there where the blood of the lamb was spilled. I said, oh, my. Spilled as an accident. And it wasn't an accident. I said, well, it surely wasn't an accident. So I did the only smart thing to do. I went back and I looked up the word in the dictionary. You know the big fat 1828 dictionary from back when they knew how to speak English? Yeah. I looked up that word. And you know what it said? It gave the definitions. And one of the definitions was to be poured out. I thought, you know, the guy that wrote that song all those years ago, he must have known how to speak English. That guy in Oklahoma, he didn't know how to speak English. That was his problem. 
You see what I mean? Don't, don't think that you've found some hidden truth there that nobody else saw. You better check it out first before you make yourself look silly. Don't get weird. Just enjoy those good, wonderful songs. Listen, your songbook is full of wonderful truth. Don't, don't throw that aside. Just do it with enthusiasm and passion and sing it like it's real. Amen? Take those principles, run your music through there, and it'll clear up most of the problems, most of the questions you might have. Pastor.